Michael Murakarty, ta falsch rot hat das. Gurmil machen, gut, ta schön gut das, wer hat kommt, wo ihr auch ein. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> Now we're trying to get you back over 60 years. 50-51 team, what do you remember? Can you remember anything? Well, I'm in Mayo, so you'd naturally think of Mayo in those years. Now, strangely, I'd go back a little bit further. My first All-Ireland final scene was the 1948 All-Ireland final between Cavan, Polo Grounds winners the year before, and Mayo. And I think the first time you see a place or see a match, it, it makes a lasting impression on me. And I remember that match vividly. I could even stand where I stood. And Peter Quinn that time was cornerback on the Mayo team of 1948. Not in his usual half-back line. I suppose at the time they were trying to get the best formation, but Paddy Prendergast was full-back and Sean Flanagan, and a lot of players that were there in 48, and an awful lot of them were there in 51 as well. But I remember the final. Mayo didn't score in the first half, but there was an almighty gale there, blowing down towards the railway goal. Now, I was over under the queues at Near Hill 16. And I think it was something like 3-5 to no score at half time. And even though the wind was strong, I thought, oh, they've no chance. But bit by bit, they pulled it back until that fateful moment when they had a free-to-draw level at 4-5 four, four, apiece, I think. Paul Carney taking it, a little bit to the right, the angle was severe, but... Whether he moved out from the goal or was too near the ball, Mick Higgins fielded the ball. I can still see Mick fielding the ball. It was cleared out the field then and the game was over. But Mayo, that day, they had given a clear signal that they were a team to be reckoned with. Disappointed then, I was disappointed when they didn't reappear in Crow Park and all that day in 1949. I had sympathy for them losing to Cavan, but we had accepted that cabin team was a super team. And to run them to one point must maybe a few weeks after was giving them great confidence for, for what was ahead. And then of course the 50 to 51 and by then I knew a lot of them. I knew Tom Langan and I knew Paddy Prendergast and I knew Joe Stanton and I knew the McAndrews, they were great characters. Big Pat, a huge man and John, a big man if Pat wasn't around. And Peter Quinn, in those years, he had moved out from the corner, the corner that Johnny Ford occupied later then, a, a strong, sturdy man, and I think the wing suited Peter Quinn. Right half in 50, left half in 51. You know, he was a versatile type of player. And one player that he always reminded me of was Mick O'Dwyer of Kerry, when he was a defender. Now, defenders are not noticed as much as forwards are. Because if a forward scores a goal, or as they say nowadays, assists in a goal, in other words, gives a pass, that'll be remembered. But a back sometimes might clear ten balls and be beaten for one that yields a point to the opposition, and that's the one that gets highlighted. But Mick O'Dwyer in his time later, he was a half-back that always played better than you thought he did, leaving the field. When you'd see a rear on of it or think back over it again, you'd say to yourself, Mick will play better than I thought. Now, he reminded me of Peter Quinn, who was the same sort of player, very effective, knew what was expected of a half back in those days, under the guiding eye of, you know, Henry Dixon. The centre back is usually the commanding figure around there, as the full back would be inside of the goalkeeper. But Peter was able to you know, to read the others, to read the play. And that was the best thing about him. That's why I liked Mick O'Dwyer when he came along. He reminded me very much of a man that, you know, that had won all Ireland. When you've won in all Ireland, you have a standing, you have a status. Mick O'Dwyer had won none when he was a half-back, but won two there, moved to the forward. He got a lot more notice as a forward, but he was a very effective half-back. So I have great memories of those teams when they won and... Paul Carney, I meet him when he comes home often. Tom Langan was a guard in Fitzgibbonsy Station. We used to know him because we used to play cards down in a house in Fairview and any time Tom would be on night duty. He'd come in the door, take off the cap and he'd have a cup of tea with us and he might play a hand and then after a while go out again to see if anything happened. We often, I used to stay at the time with Sean Murphy of Kerry. 
and Sean had great respect for that Mayo team because he his first championship game for Kerry was against Mayo in the All Ireland semi final of nineteen fifty one. He had won a junior All Ireland in forty nine, a minor in fifty, and here he was in fifty one, right half back in the Mayo team. It was his first big day as a senior in Crow Park. It was against Mayo. So he spoke very fondly and still does about that Mayo team. But mention Tom Langan was there and Paddy Erwin, who was a member of that team as well and played at half forward in fifty one. He was a guard there. And we used to often there was no real organised training. We used to go up to the guard the grounds in Phoenix Park with the guard the and there was a guard there from Kerry, Dan Sullivan. We used to have great fun. And Tom Langan, a hell of a decent man. All the guard they lived in barracks in those days. And Tom used to tell us if you're stuck in town any time and he'd give you the weeks that he'd be on night duty, he could go in and sleep in my bed, you see. <laughs> he was that sort of a player and uh, they were a very sociable type of that team as well. And Paddy Carney, of course, you know, people all talking about Paddy Carney, he was a forward and midfield. But they, they were a great team. And uh, what was amazing about it, the variety of, you know, if you like, professions there. We know Peter Quinn, or Quinlan as he was as well, and that just confused people. Where did Peter Quinn go, you know? And, Who's this fella Quinn? <laughs> and what were your own thoughts on that clerical ban? Well, I thought it was ridiculous, really. But then it was. He wasn't. He wasn't the first, you know. You know, to have a little bit of difficulty. There was a famous. He became Archbishop of Perth later on. Mundy Prendable. He left All Hallows College in 1923 to play in the All Ireland final against Dublin. Hadn't got permission. 1924. When he came back to college, he wouldn't be admitted. And he had terrible, terrible difficulty in being ordained. But he finished up as Archbishop of Perth. <laughs> but he was one. When Kildare won the All Ireland in 1919, Larry Stanley captained him. But nobody knew that his brother Jim was on the team as well. He was a priest, but he played under an assumed name. And it was years afterwards that his name was put into the record books as Jim Stanley. Wexford had a priest when they won the four in a row in the, before the 1920s, but it was difficult for them. It was okay when they were on holidays, they could play. But once, if they were gone back to college, Minute and places like that, no out. They wouldn't even be let watch it on television and things. Maybe it was part of the discipline, you know, that was deemed to be required. But um, anyway, I have great memories of those Mayo teams and the times and they played entertaining football as well, refined football, skillful players, every one of them, but a great team really, and it's time that was repeated. Well, it was almost repeated, as you know, through you know the last say, 10, oh, yes, 15 yes. years, almost repeated, but Kerry proved a big obstacle on several on occasions. On several occasions, but that will change as well, that will change as well, and you ne know, never know when. League was a quarter final in Croke Park this year. Kerry looked at one and suddenly Mayo stuck and it was over. Same as they did in the 51 semi final. Towards the finish, they took over. Took over against uh, a good Kerry team. And the highest ball I ever saw being caught in Croke Park was caught the, that day by a man called Eddie Dowling, who was buried about two weeks ago. And he was buried and known to me, and he was a great friend of mine, against Mayo in that semi final. But now you talked about the style of football. Compare the style of football in this 50-51, that era, to the style of football today. Well, Mayo had their own style, I always thought. They, they like to win with style, and maybe that's the reason why they haven't won more. Stry, uh, style, they were lovely foot passers, and that team in particular used a lot of them. You know, a jab, kick, always well positioned to the player. They also played as a team, even though in that era, Lots of teams played as individuals. A player won his contest with his opponent and then just delivered the ball anywhere but forward. Let it go forward. And then it's up to the next man to win his ball. But that Mayo team played the ball to suit their own player, you know. To drop on his strong side, to drop a little bit short if they thought he'd embossed the pace. 
there was obviously, I don't know who did it, there were no managers in those days. I think there were lots of strong characters on the team that had ideas. The likes of, a I know Eamon Mongey well. As I said, I met them all and I used to enjoy meeting them and talking about it. I'd say Eamon Mongey, he would be what I called a strong character. And of course, Sean Flanagan was and Paddy Carney and, you know, the Gilvaris and so on, a lot of them. Well, they spoke about it. The people we spoke yeah. to, they spoke about being so strong that they, I don't know if you're familiar with this famous letter they wrote in November the, the 1947. Well, the that, was, that was a good sign in a yeah. way. And I often think that it's good for a team to have a little bit of friction with the county board. That gives them a cause. And that Mayo team, they had that friction. Otherwise, they wouldn't have written the letter. But still in all, they had the belief, if you write the letter, maybe something will be done about it you know, to look after, do things properly. And they did, but they had the cause and they went on to prove our letter did that. That would be behind. We have to justify what we did, you know, because not many people would be critical of officers or authority at the time, but there were strong characters and, of course, uh, they had doctors and they had solicitors and they had politicians and they had farmers and they had priests. God, the teachers, they had every, they had a great mixture of, of society. Mayo today? Mayo today, they're always hope. And I don't know whether I should say it or not, I think Mayo, you rarely, if ever, see a bligard on a Mayo team. And a lot of teams might have one or two that you'd call maybe half bligards, that you'd be criticising. But behind it all, the people that would be criticised and would be glad that you had them. <laughs> but He's our <laughs> yeah, yeah, quietly. But Mayo never went in. Mayo went for winning with honour. And take that fantastic game that was between Dublin and Mayo a few years ago. 2006. Yes. That Keir MacDonald scored the winning point. I still say that was the best game of Gaelic football that I ever saw. I, I, I saw that, you know. Both sides set out to play football. They played football. It was high quality football. There was great pace to it. There was a fantastic atmosphere. And um, people, other people say, I know that the tough game that you win by a point is a better game. But that was it. So there's a great tradition of football in Mayo. They're all the time. And if I could say, a friend of my father, Leo Moore, I remember meeting him one year, it would be maybe back in the 70s. From Lewisburg? Oh yes, uh, for, yeah, Lewisburg. Mayo beat Galway in a replay of a comic final and I was broadcasting, I was at it and it was a good game and Mayo looked good. Called to see Father Leo that evening and we gave a good while talking about it. They were due to play Kerry the following Sunday in the all Ireland semi-final, only one week in account of it being a replay. And I'll never forget the last thing he said as I took off. He said, isn't it an awful pity we've only one week to look forward to it? You know, not the match itself, but to look forward to it. There was a lot in that, and I think that's the real spirit of football. It's entertainment, it's an event. It's not just 60 minutes that you speak the time of playing and uh, one side wins, the other, it's over then. It's not over then. People will be talking about it after, but it's an awful pity we've only one week to look forward to it. Mayo people always looked forward to that football. They enjoyed that football and they gave an awful lot of enjoyment to people, especially that great team of, I would say, 48 to 55. They were in a replay against Dublin, beaten in, the re in a replay of an all Ireland semi-final in 55 and won a league, of course, in between and maybe more, so travelled to America. Uh, the, the tradition is there to be a big day when Sam Maguire returns. You never know, it might, mightn't be far away. Call 